welcome. Uh, I'm Henrique Lopez. I'm a machine learning engineer at Nubank. And today I'm going to present FK Learn, which is our machine learning library developed inside Nubank and that we open source uh, this year, in April this year. So the idea is go through a tutorial where I show uh, how to use FK Learn to do like machine learning, build a model, evaluate your model. But before doing the actual tutorial, I just wanted to do a quick intro, showing, like, explaining why we decided to build our own machine learning library instead of like using uh, other libraries that are already in the market. So to understand that, uh, I want to explain a bit of the, the con context where FK Learn was built, so uh, how Nubank works. So for those that don't know, Nubank, it's a technology company uh, that provides financial services. Uh, it started in Brazil six years ago with a credit card and zero customers. And now we have more than 10 million customers. Uh, we have multiple financial products like uh, credit card, savings account, personal loans. And we are also expanding to other countries. So uh, we have started, announced that we will have a product in Argentina and Mexico too. So the company is growing very fast, uh, but at the same time, behind this very fast growth, uh, New Bank has a very data-driven mindset. So uh, we invest a lot on data infrastructure to guarantee that data scientists and business analysts and everyone that needs to use data to, to their daily jobs has all the tools and all the data they need to guarantee that they can take the best decision. And for New Bank, this is really important because when you're talking about financial products, uh, every decision has a huge impact, both, both like on the amount of customers and also in terms of financial impact. So we need to guarantee that uh, we do the best decisions. So in this context, we had uh, two big challenges to face with our machine learning library. We, the first one is the scalability. So we needed to guarantee that uh, we could build like very fast models. So every new product, every, every new customer that enters, and we have a lot of new customers, we are able to use machine learning to take decisions for these customers. So we had a huge need for a library that allowed us to deploy new models, new versions very fast. But at the same time, uh, we needed to guarantee that uh, the models that we, we were putting in prod, prod uh, we were confident that they will work very well. So we needed a library that provided us an extensive set of validations where we, ha we were confident that uh, a new model that we put in prod, prod we have uh, no blind spots and we have checked for all the necessary validations before uh, deciding to take decisions with this model. So we had these two big challenges. And from that, we decided uh, that the, like the main pillars of the library would be the, the first pillar is uh, models as functions. Uh, so we decided to go for a functional approach. And the reason for that is basically uh, to make use of all the advantages of functional programming. So immutability, poor functions, higher level of functions, which guarantees us way more trustability when we put a model in prod. Uh, we know that because it's a pure function, the results are always the same. And also, it's very easy to put models in prod because you basically have a function that you need to uh, pass to your service and needs to, the, all it needs to do is get data and pass through this function and everything solved. The second thing is, as I said, we needed to have uh, good validation. So we built a library that uh, you can build a very extensible and complex set of validations for your model. And it's very easy to validate that. And at the same time, it needs to be very customizable because we have very different sets of problems. So we work with credit models, but we also have like NLP models, models for customer service. So we have very different contexts and each context has a very different way of validating models. So we needed a, a library that was very customizable in that sense. And finally, of course, we needed something that scaled really fast and that we could like go from a research or a Jupyter notebook very fast into production. So once the model is fully validated, we needed to launch very fast and create new versions very fast. 
So that these were the pillars that SKLearn was built in. And then came the decision of like actually open sourcing it. And the reason why uh, we thought it made sense to open source FKLearn is because like uh, given that it has both scalability and very complex validation and very customizable validation, uh, we felt like it would be useful both for production scenarios but also for research. So it kind of fitted very well to different uh, types of data science work. So we felt we could contribute a lot to the community by open source it and showing the world how to use FKLearn. And that's also the reason why we are here, to show a bit how and what are the advantages of using FKLearn. Okay. So for this tutorial, if, uh, I will show the, all the code here, but if you want to follow via your notebook, you can go to the GitHub, uh, FKLearn GitHub, uh, as it's an open, open source project, you can go there. You can clone the project to your machine, install it, and uh, on the folder FKLearn doc source examples, you'll find two notebooks. One is the FKLearn overview data set generation, which will generate the data set that we will, we will use as a mock for our example here. And the other one is the FKLearn overview itself, which is the one that I'll go through in detail. Uh, I'll give some time for the, the guys that are interested in actually cloning the repo, and then I will start. Uh, while I'll give that time for you guys, uh, I want to explain very quickly what is this data set that I will be generating. So basically, the idea is to, to mock a problem that we have at Nubank, so we can feel a bit how we use the FKLearn to solve problems at Newbank. And here, uh, what, I'm, what I will try to predict is how much a customer will spend on their credit card in the next two months. So I created some like fe mock features, I simulated some data of like the past spend of the customer, the, the cell phone type of uh, this customer has, some bureau scores, so external sources of data, and I mocked all of this and I created a complex function that uh, encodes all this as a target. So that's where, that's the data set that we'll be working on on creating our model, okay? So now I'll go to the notebook. Okay, you can see that we've grown a lot in terms of forks and stars since the this, this image, the other one is more updated, has more stars, so also uh, I encourage you, uh, if you like the presentation, to go on GitHub and give us a star. It's very good uh, to show that our project is, is growing and being more relevant. And we are also, we already reached 1,000 stars, which is pretty relevant for a data science machine learning library, but we always want to grow more. So. I basically talked about these things here, so I'll jump to the input analysis and showing a bit of the data set that I just mentioned. This, this doesn't use FKLearn, it's just a traditional machine learning analysis, pre-analysis that you do on your data before jumping into the FKLearn. But I, will, I won't lose too much time here because the, I think the different parts that you guys are not used to is how we do uh, models in FKLearn itself. So basically, this is the data set that I'll be working on. ID is basically an identifier of the customer, and I have multiple data for this customer on every month that he's a customer of Newbank. And I have like income data, I have uh, the phone type, I have some scores, I have some noise also, just to check how the model would deal with uh, noise and I have how much he spends. And in the end, what I want to predict is the average spend of this customer in the next two months. Okay. So if I take a look uh, at the features, uh, like nothing very relevant here. Uh, what I can see is that income has like a max very high compared to the 75 percentile. This is, this is what I did to try to simulate uh, like some bug that happens like, customers have infinite income, so we need to treat that on our models. 
uh, just to show that models are not just a fit and transform, we need to think a bit of the data that we have and propose it a bit. And these are the features that I'll be working with. Uh, as I said, some randomly generated features. Uh, looking at the missing, I have some missings at Bureau of Scars. The idea of having missings here is to simulate uh, a problem that you have when communicating with external data sources. Sometimes they might not have this customer on their base or it's just a problem with like HTTP request or something like that. So you can have uh, lack of data for these cases. So I'm trying to simulate that here. And the features, as I said, are like normal distributions, other types of distributions. And in the end, I combine them to create a, a span formula here. And I use this monthly span, like the next two month spans as a target for my model, okay? Plotting here uh, the amount of customers, so the amount my my base is growing very fast. Uh, this is interesting because uh, on real life problems, you always have the like the temporal challenge of understanding how things are changing over time, and we will also show how we can validate this type of problems or these types of behaviors with FKLearn with this. Quickly showing the distribution here of the features. Won't lose much time here. The targets, just a sign check if we don't have missing at the targets. We only have missing at the last two months, and that's because like we are censored in the sense that we don't know how much these customers will spend on the next two months because these two months didn't happen yet. So we can't use these two months to train our model. We can only train until that point. And as you can see, the, the average spend is, is dropping over time. We can also like try to understand how this will affect the model performance later. So now we're going to the fun part, which is actually starting to use FKLearn. So the first thing every data science does when, at least you should, <laughs> when building a new model is to split your data into train and test. On, on real life scenarios, uh, we pretty much never would use something like a random split because we want to like add semantical meaning to our split so we can represent better what happens in real life. So in this case here, I'll be splitting both in time, so my training data will always be before the validation. And I'll also split on what we call spatial splitting, which is basically uh, I will train on a set of customers and validate on a different customer, even though they have like multiple uh, months where this customer is here, just to guarantee that I'm not overfitting to this population and that the model will generalize well to different customers that will come every month. Uh, that's really important because when you put in production, if you're like a company like Nubank that's growing very fast, we will have a diff completely different uh, set of customers that we will be scoring. So you need to guarantee that your model is not overfitting on specific population. So what it looks like is something like this. So I have a training set uh, which has a subset of customers and I also split on time. So I end up with four uh, data sets. One is the training, and all other are different types of validation. And so how we do that with FKLearn, it's very simple. Uh, we have a space-time split data set function. And as you can see here, everything will be a function. It's very, we won't find classes here. So because it's functional, everything is uh, a pure function that receives parameters and returns some variables. Usually we work with pandas data frames, so that's the way of communicating with data. And so here I'm calling this a space split data set and I'm passing my original data frame, which I read before. Um, and I'm passing like this, this period that I want to split my data. So like the train is starting here, is ending here, which is like from 2017 to 2018. I have some period for validation until October, uh, and that's basically it. So I'm calling this function, and it's returning me four data sets, as I'm showing here, okay? 
Now uh, we want to, to train our model. So that's the first step uh, we will engage on is like uh, training the model. But as I said before, uh, we've seen some things on the data that we need to tackle before actually uh, doing some regression on the model. So in this case here, uh, you probably want to cap the feature, like the income feature you saw that's a very strange value on some cases. So we probably want to cap to avoid the effect of outliers on your model. Uh, you also want to encode the categorical feature. So we have some phone data and you want to create categories from that. Uh, you have some missing data for the bureau score, so you want to do some str strategy for missing or not, depending on the model that you're building. And you want to tr finally train your model. Uh, so how this works on FKLearn? So it's something similar to what you would do on SKLearn fit transform, but in a functional way, which guarantees that like the function that you return is pure. Uh, if, if you ever worked with sklearn, you might find yourself like uh, declaring a model, fitting it, transforming, then you fit again and you don't know like what result to expect from this transform because the class has been changed a lot of times and you have what we call a, a state. So uh, the order that you run your notebook uh, influences the, the result of your model transform. Uh, that's what we want to avoid with fklearn. Because if you train a model and it depends on the state of the notebook, it's very hard to put that model in production because you have to guarantee that the, like the state of the function is uh, correct. When you're dealing with fklearn, you don't need that because a function that gives you a result will never give you a different result for the same data. It doesn't depend on the state of this, this notebook. So you can put in prod on a completely different environment and will still give you the same results. And how that works. So on training time, we would have the scenario on the left here, which I, I create a pipeline and I give my training data and we will pass to, to these functions and each function will learn something. So like the, if it's a label encoder, it will learn the labels and the translation of the labels and we will output a function, which is the orange part of this. Uh, so the learning happens on the blue part and the, the function that we returns is the orange part. So when I create a pipeline, I basically go through all this blue stuff and return what we see on the right, which is only the orange functions. So when I'm scoring the data, which is the equivalent of the transform part of sklearn, what I'll be doing is basically applying these functions to the data. I remove the blue part because I'm not learning anything new when scoring the data. I'm just transforming what I have already. So how that works on fklearn, here is a, just a quick explanation of uh, functional programming technology. It's basically, if you have a function that depends on like a data set and a lot of parameters, uh, when you're working with functional, you can create a, what we call a partial function by defining the parameters one and two. Uh, you still have a function that depends on data sets. So you kind of predefine two of the parameters, but you still have a partial function. That's a, like an important concept that we use a lot here. So let's see how I would build this pipeline here. And the way I would do is basically creating these partial functions for each step of my model. So let's say I need to cap the feature, the income feature on arbitrary value of uh, 2000K here. So the way I do this is create a capper uh, where I define the column that I want to cap and I define what is the cap for this, this column. Uh, very quickly, let's see if I can show you the code of the capper just to, so you can understand better the, uh, let me see where is, Transformation, okay. So if you look at the code of the capper uh, and compared to the what I have here, I defined the value of columns to cap and pre-computed caps, but I didn't define the data frame that this will be applied on. So here I have like uh, a parameter that I didn't define yet. So this is a partial function. So here 
Uh, the color of the code is not. Okay. Yeah, I, I need to increase the size here. It's better? No problem. I have a hard time zooming in on PyCharm. But yes, uh, sorry, so I'll, I'll go through this again. Uh, on the other code, I defined the variables columns to cap and the, column, the variable pre-computed caps, but I didn't define which data frame this will be applied on. And why I did this way? Because this way I create a generic capper function that can be applied to any data frame. Like, any data frame that apply this, it will apply this transformation. So let's see how that evolves in my code. And I do that for all the, all the partial functions. So the label categorizer, I do the same thing. I just define the columns to categorize, but I don't define the data frame that will be applied on. The same for the inputter, which uh, fills the missing values. I only define the columns to inputs and the put input strategy. I don't define the data frame. And finally, the LGBM regression learner. So I'm, here I'm using a light GBM uh, model. I don't define the data frame that this will be applied on. So what's happening here is that I'm creating this box of encoder, missing, capper, and regressor but I'm not defining what is the green data that I'm going to pass to these functions. And that's very useful because if I change my green data, I have another training data, I don't need to redefine all this stuff again, I don't have a state, I have a set of functions that I can pass anything to it and it will return a different training model. So, continuing here, I create a pipeline that exactly defines that box and the link between the functions, and then I can finally generate this training function, which I can apply to any data set. Here I'm applying, applying to the train set that I created before, but it could be any data set that I wanted. And what this returns me is a predict function, which is basically the right box here, this one, that's the predict function. It's like the same functions, the same pipeline, but already learned the, the parameters of the model, the regressor, the capper, and everything. It also returns the train set, but transformed with the predictions. So basically, already does a fit transform on the training data. Not very useful like to look at predictions, but it's useful uh, to test if you're, how your model is overfitting, for instance. You can compute performance from this data and return returns a set of logs, which is basically metadata about the transformations that you did. It, this is very important uh, for multiple reasons. Like, if you want feature importance, it will be on the logs, but also if you want, like, if you deploy your model, uh, you can always deploy it together with the trained logs, so you have metadata of when I trained this model, how met, many, da many data points I used to train the model. So this is very useful for us. And that's the result of like the fit and transform. This is the data set. It has a new column, which is the prediction column. But like, that's not very useful. Uh, if I look at the train logs and I access the regressor learner, I can access like the feature importance of this model from here. I can plot this data frame that has the feature importance. Okay, so like, so far the, the the only advantage of having FK Learn is like building this pipeline with ease. But uh, I will show how, how good having functions as models is. Because if you remember, I have three validation sets. And if I had like a SK Learn, I would to need to apply like the transformation a lot of times. Uh, but as I said, you don't have guarantees that the transformation is, is stateless. So every time you apply the transformation, you have to check if the model is the same. Here, because I generated the predict function, I'm pretty sure that the, the model is stateless, it will give always the same result. So I can apply the predict function to all the validation sets. So I had three validation sets. I can apply this same predict function to all of them, and it will return me a different data set for each one of them with the predictions for these, these customers. 
So if I take a look at one specific of them, which is both out of time and space, uh, I have like predictions for these customers. Okay, so I have my model. Now the, the, the next step is of course validating the model. So how you validate models inside FKLearn? And the cool thing is if you think about like what probably you want to validate uh, the first validation step, it's a regression model, so we probably want to look at uh, R squared and maybe some like Spearman correlation, something like that. But in the end, you want to validate all these data sets the same way. So why not do uh, abstraction that looks like this? So I create a evaluation function that is not applied to any data set directly. It depends on the data set that we'll be using, but it'll always compute the R squared and the Spearman correlation for all these data sets. So then I can pipe all the data sets that I generated to have the performance for them. And how you do that with FKLearn. So basically import the evaluators and you define like what's the prediction column, what's the target column for them. And you create a combined evaluator that has both the R squared and the Spearman evaluator. And then you can like, you create this eval function which can be used uh, several times to compute the performance on all the data sets that you had previously. Okay? And what this returns you? A very, like, uh, dictionary with performance. But data science don't like dictionaries, right? We like data frames. At least I prefer data frames than dictionaries. And these dictionaries can get very big, so it's hard to, to handle them. That's why we have, like, the extractors. And the extractors is a very good way of going back to data frames from performance logs. Uh, and how you do that, you basically, like, you have uh, R squared evaluator and a Spearman evaluator. You create a combined evaluator that has both extractors, and you apply them to the log. Very simply, like this, return you a data frame for each one. Here I'm concatenating all just to show uh, what's happening. So. Right now, it's basically I did all the steps of training a simple model, and I want to go back a bit. So let's say like the performance is really good, you're satisfied you're with your model, you want to put it in production. Uh, how would you do that? Uh, it's actually really simple. All you need to do is get your predict function, this one, and pickle it, and it's a production model. So uh, for us, this was like a pretty huge and important aspect of FKLearn, uh, that we have like trustability, that our models are immutable, and we can very easily put a function in production as already scoring a new model. So it's very easy to do new versions or new models by having like a very standard way of deploying models like this. Okay, but the other part of FKLearn is complex validation, right? So that's the way we did uh, scalability, but we, need, we still need to validate because uh, here I only have like a few set of metrics and things can get way more complex. So if you go to like uh, a business uh, decision with your, like my R squared is 0.63, I want to ship this model, uh, you might be faced with a lot of questions like, uh, how is the model performing over time? How is the model performing on the subpopulation? What would happen with the model performance if I had more data? Uh, is the old data helping or uh, making our model worse? So you might be faced with a lot of questions and what we found by experience in bank is that a lot of these questions are the same for a lot of models. So what we invested a lot was creating an easy way to answer most of these questions using FKLearn. Okay, and so here I'll give some examples on how we answer some of these questions and how easy it is to use the abstractions that we defined before uh, to validate these things. So the first uh, validation that I will go through is like, uh, what would happen if I had more data, which is usually called as a spatial learning curve. So if we actually had more data to train our model, we would simply train the model and see if the model is performing better. But the thing is, you don't have it, you need to simulate what would happen. 
And a good way to simulate uh, what would happen with your model if you had more data is doing several trainings with like uh, gradually more data uh, from your training set and validate this model uh, on a fixed uh, amount of data and see how the performance of your model is improving. So something like that. I would train model one with very small amount of data and validate. Then I train model two with more data and validate. And this would give me like uh, a curve of how my model is improving with more data, right? And of course, I can like uh, abstract what would happen with even more data than what I have today. So how, in a more general sense, what I'm doing here is I'm splitting my data into subsets of trainings and tests. So train one is a very small training with a large test. Train two is a slightly bigger training set with uh, the same test set and so on and so forth. So it's something like that. I split into multiple combinations of training tests. I train a model on this train. I validate the test and I get results for all this. So this first train here would be the train one with very small data. And if I go through this flow, I get the performance of train one. The next one would be train two with slightly more data. If I go to this flow, I get the performance of train two. And then I can evaluate how my model is getting better with data. But uh, when you look at this and you look at the training function, what has changed from the training function that I defined before? Nothing actually. Like it's the same pipeline that I want to apply to different sets of data. And what, what has changed from my evaluation function? Nothing, because I still want to uh, infer what's the R squared and the experiment correlation of this model. So basically what I need to define is a, a splitting function that will create these folds of train and tests for me. And that's done for, for, for the spatial learning curves then with the spatial learning curve splitter, surprise. And I pass here that the space column is the ID, the time column is the month, and I want to train my model with like 1% of all the training data, 20% uh, of, 10%, sorry, 10% of all the training data, 20% of all the training data, and so on and so forth. And then I pass through this like abstraction, which is exactly this flow here, but written on code. So it receives a training set, it applies the splitting, it applies the training, it applies the evaluation, and gives me all the logs that I need. So after doing this validator, what I get is like a huge log of all the trainings and all the validations that I have from this process. And as I said, like the extraction is still the same because I'm, I still want to get the R squared and the experiment correlation out of this model. So if I extract that using the same extractor that I defined before, I get a data frame that looks like this. So uh, I have the matrix, R squared and Spearman, and I have like the train size, and what's the percentage of this, is, uh, of the total is this training. So I have like different percentages and different metrics for each percentage. So I can very easily plot something that looks like this. So the R squared performance, uh, given the amount of data that I'm using for training. And here's like the first example of how FK learning functions are useful for you to like reuse the same functions that you'd find before. So you don't need to worry if your validation is actually running the same model that you had uh, on the first step because you are using the same function and it's pure. So uh, you always will the same results. So. That's how we do it. I'll go to a, one more example. Which is, com uh, now, the other question that we had there is like, how is your model performing over time? So if you think about this question, uh, you don't actually need to retrain your model. You just need to evaluate your model on subpopulations, one for each month. So uh, instead of going through all this flow, what I need to do is like define subpopulations and use the same evaluation function 
on the, these different subpopulations, right? So here I'm defining a split evaluator, which takes the evaluation function original, but I can define like a, a splitting column of month and what values I want to split on. So I want to evaluate this model uh, from all months from zero to 25. So all the full two years of uh, data that I have. And I also define an extractor, which will, from the logs, extract the performance into a data frame in the same way that it did for a simple validation. So now I can call this function on my holdout data, which has the predictions, and I can apply the extractor on the logs that I generated, and I'll have uh, a data frame that looks like this. So for each month, it computes me the performance of the model. Uh, in the beginning, it should be really noisy because you don't have many customers on the first months and should stabilize later or the performance might get worse depending if your model is like uh, losing performance over time. So let's see in a chart how it's looking here. So it seems like your model is not getting worse. It's like has some noise in the beginning because of a few customers, but it's kind of stable over the same values. So. What I'm showing here is that it's very easy to go from your evaluation, a simple evaluation, to a more complex one that computes the evaluation on different sets of people. And you, on complex uh, contexts, you might have like very different subsets and complex subsets. So uh, in this scenario, we might, might want to evaluate like how the performance is different from iPhone users and Android users. Uh, because I have the, this feature, it's very easy to create an evaluator on top of that, and I can combine evaluators. So I could have like Android versus iPhone, but I could also have Android versus iPhone by month, by something else. So it's very easy to create complex trees of validation. Okay? And then uh, my final example here is like, what if I want to combine both? So what if I want to check the impact of having more data on a monthly basis? So now I want to combine my spatial learning curve with the monthly performance evaluator. Uh, here, uh, as I said uh, before, you already have your training function. You already have your evaluator function that you just created above. You already have your split function that does your folds given your original data. So your task is as simple as calling the parallel validator again, but instead of using the normal evaluator, you pass the monthly evaluator function. So you didn't create any new code, and you're doing a very different uh, evaluation and comparison, uh, and there's a huge value on that because uh, you lose very little time to check uh, different uh, subsets, different validations, different assumptions, and you can guarantee that your model has very small blind spots or no blind spots. So uh, when I create this parallel validator, I already receive a log with the validation. And if I use the same extractor that I had before, uh, I already have a data frame here. Uh, so let's take a look of oh, what this data frame is showing me. So it has the R squared as Spearman, as we are now used to. It has like the month which it's evaluating. So I'm evaluating the month 15, the month 16, the month 17. But it also uh, has the percentage of the training data that was used for this month. So as you can see, I have the month 15 two times here, or three times or more. And for each of these times, I have a different percentage of the training data. So I'm using more and more data uh, for this, this evaluation. And if I plot this again, what looks like is something like this. So for each month, with more data, how my performance is varying. Uh, as expected, like the adding more data has a symmetric shape and regarding all months. So the model is kind of learning and the same rate for all the all the months. But you can also see like that the month 15 performs worse than the other months. Uh, I don't have like an explanation for the simulated data, why this is happening, but it's just a way of showing uh, the types of validation that you can do and how easily you can check for different scenarios and not rely on a like single 
R squared or a UC metric to deploy your model, right? And what else do we have on FKLearn? Uh, basically, this was the example that I wanted to bring you guys, but what else could we do with FKLearn? So we have several other learning curves. So here I showed only the spatial learning curve, but as I said, there are many questions that you can ask, like uh, what's the, the performance of my model uh, over time? So you ca could do a validation that uh, gradually uh, makes your holdout further and further away from your training and computes the metric for that. So you could answer like uh, if your portfolio of your data is changing a lot, you would see uh, a drop in performance on your holdout. Uh, there are several other learning curves that we could use and we have all of them implemented here. Um, we have other algorithms, so let's say you want to do uh, XGBoost or linear regression or other types of models, we have all of them there. Uh, and we have other interfaces for common data science uh, tasks. For instance, let's say you want to do a feature selection. Uh, if you think about feature selection, it's not much different from a learning curve. So basically, the training function would be the same as the training function before but every, every iteration you take a feature away from your model. Uh, the evaluation would be the same because you want to evaluate the same metric when you remove features from your model. And the extractor would be the same. So calling a feature selection would be a feature selection algorithm would be as simple as calling like a parallel validator and will give you all the results for all the subsets of features that you want to select. And parameter tuning is the same. Like, Basically, you're doing several training steps and validation, but changing your parameters from your model. So all of that comes very easy once you define like your training function and your evaluation function. That's the, the value of FKLearn. And if you want to learn more about FKLearn, we have a blog post about how was the process of building uh, FKLearn. Uh, we have actually two blog posts. One is like the introduction to FKLearn, and the second one is a more in-depth uh, blog post about how to validate models and how we build all these things that I showed you here. And we also have documentation from, for all the functions that we have on FKLearn. And I think that's it. So uh, now I can open to questions. So if you have uh, questions about uh, the, the library or new bank or anything. Uh, I just wanted to make a quick note that we have uh, some people from new bank here if you want to raise your hands. So uh, after the presentation, we will be uh, at the, the meetings and the other presentations and tomorrow and Sunday as well. So if you have any questions uh, that you want to do about FKLearn, new bank or uh, anything that we could answer, we will be around. So please ask us, and tomorrow we'll have also a stand, so it's easier to find us tomorrow. But feel free to ask anything. Thanks. Hello. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I have a question about how do you persist this function and does it cut down dependency in production or things like that? How do I parse the function? How do you persist this function for productionizing? Okay, so uh, of course like the, the way you put in production uh, things depend a lot on your infrastructure. So we have an uh, infrastructure that's very well built around the FKLearn. So uh, for us, putting a model in production is as simple as serializing this uh, FKLearn predict function, as I said, and just unserializing it on the production environment. And it's pretty safe in the sense that the function is immutable, so you don't need to worry about too much about the environment that you're uh, unserializing your function. It should work really well. Uh, of course, like uh, real-time models and batch models have very different ways because you need to set up an endpoint so you can like give all your features to your model or something like that, and this varies. But the model itself, given like the data, it's pretty much a function that you want to serialize in production. 
Thank you. Hi, uh, nice presentation. So my question is, so what is the backend of FKLearn? I mean, so I'm, I'm wondering, does it call scikit-learn API or? Yes, basically, uh, we didn't re-implement all the algorithms like logistic regression, random forest or anything. We use like the most traditional libraries. So behind FKLearn, we have SKLearn, we have XGBoost, we have LightGBM, all the implementation, the, the most common implementations of these uh, algorithms. We basically do a wrapper uh, on top of that so it's functional and we guarantee that you can't like actually change the model class, for instance. So uh, I can show you very quickly uh, one for Need to zoom again. So if you go for the LightGBM function, we basically import the, the library itself and inside here we'll use the signature that the LightGBM uses, which is not functional. But when we return the predict function would be this P and it's immutable and it already has the object inside it on its closure. So you can't actually change that. It's immutable in that sense. But yeah, we didn't re-implement any algorithm. Thank you. Uh, maybe I missed it, but um, in this library, do you have the capability to work with neural networks? Not yet. Okay. So uh, that's one of the main things that we, we want to understand how we would add uh, neural networks or any other libraries that already has this functionality to FKLearn. Uh, like the reason that we open source is both that we want to share like the work we did with the community but we are really open to contributions and people like uh, trying to understand how we could improve the library by adding new functionalities in this, this environment. So no, we don't have anything for neural nets yet. 